Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast and happy Monday. Hope everybody had a great Easter weekend, Passover weekend, depending on depending on your your religious affiliation. Uh, joining me again on the podcast, Will Salatan. Thanks for coming back, Will. Hey, it's great to be back with you, Charlie. Coming back. I mean, it's 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 Will and Charlie Monday. So, so <laughs> So among the stories that I would not mind wallowing in, the report that Alex Jones's InfoWars site files for bankruptcy, Chapter 11, as a result of all the lawsuits that led to millions of dollars in legal fees. So we could start off this day after Easter with thoughts and prayers for Alex Jones. You, that, those are your thoughts, rather than those prayers. <laughs> My thoughts. I'm going to give a. I'm going to give a minute of silence for Alex Jones, and yeah. and that was 60 seconds more than he deserved. See, the thing about this is that we constantly are caught in this loop of nothing matters. No one's ever held accountable. There are no consequences. And yet you have a moment like this, and I guess you want to cherish it just a little bit because there are consequences for Alex Jones for lying about people. I mean, among the most vile things to have happened in the last couple of years, you know, him lying about uh, the massacre of those children at Sandy Hook. And so there's something a little bit reassuring to see that nature is healing, that the legal system is able to hold him accountable, that 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 despite all of the dynamics that we have, that you know, sooner or later it, it comes it comes home, and all of those millions and millions of dollars in legal fees apparently are going to I don't know whether it'll bring him down, but Chapter Eleven. So, what else do you want to talk about? You want to talk about tanning testicles because that's a thing today. <laughs> <laughs> sure, right. let's talk about tanning testicles. Okay, so I on my newsletter today, I said, hey, fair warning here. Sometime today, you are going to be hearing that Tucker Carlson actually had a guest on his special report on manliness, a guest who recommended using testicle tanning to raise your flagging testosterone levels. And I think that many people will be tempted to think that this is a joke. It is not. Listen. You saw in the clip there, um, if you want to optimize and take it uh, to another level, expose yourself to red light therapy. Yes. Um, and the juve um, that we were using in the documentary, there's a massive amount Which of... Which is testicle tanning. It's testicle tanning, but it's also full body uh, red light therapy. Uh -huh. which has massive amount of benefits. And there's so much data out there um, that isn't being picked up on or covered. So obviously half the viewers right now are like, what, that's testicle tanning, that's crazy. Half. But my view is, okay, testosterone levels like crash and nobody says anything about it, that's crazy. So why is it crazy to seek solutions? It's not crazy to seek solutions. And I think um, I was recently questions. exposed to a term called bromeopathy. And I think there's a lot of people out there right now that um, are, don't trust the mainstream information. Okay, Will, we've just gone into a, just a strange, a strange place. Bromeopathy, including <laughs> standing in front of a ultraviolet light to, you know, irradiate your testicles to raise the testosterone level. I mean, where are we going here? Okay, so there's a serious way to talk about this, and there's a flippant way, and I'm yeah. proposing that we do both. Um, okay. If you, I, okay. I, I'm down for the flippant. You bring the serious. Oh, I, I got to do both. So, all right. Okay. So, all right. this the serious, which I think we can agree on. I think I heard you saying as you're as the clip is mm -hmm. playing the uh, just asking questions, right? So this is very Tucker. This is very sort of you know right wing pretend uh, skepticism, right? So. We're just questioning mainstream science, right? The mainstream media, facts, science, they're not telling you things, you know? And so therefore, because there might be some flaws, some shortcomings in mainstream science, we're gonna create this alternative in which we just make stuff up. Uh, I didn't use Charlie's word here, I just said stuff, but you know, we're making stuff up. And this, this is total nonsense, right? It's quackery, it's commercial. And this is the Tucker Carlson thing. I'm going to cultivate an audience of people hey, who well, think they're in questioning, the, who, who think that they are above <laughs> science when they're actually being persuaded to be below it. Yes, okay. So I guess the, the whole flex of Tucker toward hyper-masculinity though, you know, he, he has this, for people who haven't seen this, there's the, the trailer, the, there's the promo for this special on, you know, the, the end of manhood, which has been described by many people, um, not just me, uh, as homoerotic, you know, guys all oiled up, you know, pumping rubber, <laughs> chopping wood, grilling, firing a gun, wrestling with one another um, as, 
somebody from the Daily Beast said, you know, if he be showed that in a Florida classroom, he'd probably get arrested. Uh, but, <laughs> but, the, but, but there is something here is this is this emphasis on manliness and the the argument that one of the problems that we face is that men are not manly anymore. Their testosterone level is falling and we need to somehow restore manliness it's i mean the only thing missing from from this video is the shirtless vladimir putin which i'm sure is an oversight but 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 you know what is that all about because this is this is a theme that has been running through a lot of our politics this whole notion that donald trump you know the you know putting face man child from mar-a-lago is is somehow this manly figure there's something going on here yeah. Oh, can I pick up here about the manliness thing? So yeah. this is reminding me so much of way, way back where in the old, in the before times, Chris Matthews, when he was writing for the New Republic, wrote a piece about the mommy party and the right. daddy party. Democrats mm -hmm. were the mommy party, Republicans were the daddy party. So that actually nailed a lot of the differences between the parties. But what we have now is this Trump version, which is this kind of masculinity that's not even that, I mean, a daddy party is one that actually takes on daddy responsibilities, right? Parental responsibilities. And there's some, you know, nurturing, there's some protection that goes on. This stuff, what Tucker's doing, is just homoerotic right? It's, you don't have any responsibilities. This is all about some kind of sexual self-indulgence, self-love, adoration. It's just unmoored or, from or being Or being the strong man or being the ubermensch. Right. You know, right. it's not about responsibility or caring. It's not about character, impulse control, good sportsmanship. It's about brawn and dominance. Right. So you're not the gentleman party. No, you're right. just the, 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 the hot oiled wrestling stud party. Uh, and, 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 and I think you make a really good point connecting this to the Putin worship, right? It's not just that there are these, you know, pictures of so-called shirtless Vladimir Putin. It's that this is all connected to an idea of masculine, uh, strength expressed through a kind of brutality, right? And, and it's not surprising that this ends up leading to a lot of people getting killed because if you, if you just worship strength and you don't worship any of the virtues that are supposed to be part of masculinity understood in a civilized sense, this is where you end up. See, this is the thing about that this definition of manliness. I mean, and, and how hard it is, and I've written about this in the past, how hard it is to raise young men in the age of Trump. I mean, we all, you know, as parents, we want our kids to learn empathy and compassion. We want to teach them, you know, character and all of these things. We, we want them to, you know, learn how to win and lose graciously, treat people with respect, avoid name calling, right? And tell the truth if it's inconvenient. I mean, seriously, good luck with that now, because, you know, look at the the role models that are being out there. You know, I mean, this whole, you know, Trump is the ultimate avatar of manliness. I mean, he may be a bully, he may be a liar, a serial insulter, an abuser of women, but you know what? He's powerful. He's married to a supermodel. He's, you know, rides around in big jets. Uh, so I, I suppose, you know, this is this is kind of a new definition of 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 manliness. It's certainly not, you know, Rudyard Kipling. You know, you'll be a man, my son, if you, you know, if you uh, have these character traits. So in, instead, you can be this insecure, thin skinned, self filating orange guy down in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> and suddenly everybody going, this is manly. But I can we could just do we just acknowledge here the incredible irony of Tucker freaking Carlson deciding that he is going to be the avatar of masculinity, that this is now his new pivot. OK, so I, I'm, I'm done with the Putin celebration here. Now we're going to talk about manliness. Oh, hold on just a minute. I need to check off of my bucket list. The use of the term self filating in a podcast. That's great. Thank you. Um, the can I just point out how profoundly unconservative this this yeah. view of masculinity is? Yeah. I mean, conservatism is uh, one of the things that it should be about. Is it has starts with a pessimistic view of human nature. We are not born virtuous, right? We are taught virtue. We civilize ourselves. We civilize our children, and there is nothing civilized about this, right? This the the civilized a conservative understanding of masculinity is. Boys need to be domesticated. They need to be tamed. They need to have their masculinity channeled into Correct. constructive ways and, and less destructive ways. And this Trumpian version of it is just a celebration of, of brutality and chaos. And, you know, so it, among other things, it's very opposite of the core of conservatism. The thing about this that puzzles me 
is that Tucker Carlson is not a stupid man. And he has to understand that people will be laughing at him over this. And yet he's okay with that. Most of us have an instinct saying, if I said A, then people would mock me and show pictures of me from Dancing with the Stars and my bow tie pudding face self. Um, he doesn't worry about that. I'm, I'm interested in what's, what's going on with him, except for I really don't want people talking about what I said about Vladimir Putin and how I sided with Russia over Ukraine and I didn't give a shit about Ukraine. And so if they're laughing at me about tanning testicles, that's better than my defense of the ongoing genocide in Ukraine. Is that is that it? That's that's all I got. OK, so my best guess is that this is about one of the evils of the, the, the sicknesses of our time, which is negative identification. Right. I'm okay. going to define myself. I don't have any principles. I left them when I became a Trumper. I mean, not me, you know, yeah, the, right. the, these people. Right. So having abandoned conservatism and having abandoned al almost any principle that was associated with, oh, say, the Republican platform of 30 or 40 years ago, these people are now defining themselves entirely by owning the libs. And owning the libs, you're ac you, you may think you're a tough guy, you're actually a passive and derivative, right? You're defining yourself by the opposite of whatever the libs believe. So the libs have become, in this Tucker Carlson view, a feminized uh, America, right? right? And so we're going to be the opposite of that. Well, if you do that, you know, part of what you're defining yourself against are the virtues that go along with this so-called feminized world, which are actually the virtues of civilization. And so you become the opposite of that and you end up with this with this chaotic, right. lost, destructive version of masculinity. So that's my best guess. Well, and also, I mean, there is a, a connective tissue here, which is uh, you're all victims. You know, he has gone from the great replacement theory, which is uh, all white people are victims to now, particularly white men are victims here of the feminization. OK, so by the way, there's a lot going on here. I, I strongly recommend if people uh, who are listening to the podcast have not read Amanda Carpenter's fantastic piece about Mike Lee, who turns out to be um, a bad lawyer and a terrible liar. Uh, his support for the coup, really extraordinary. The contrast between what he has told reporters in the past about his role in overturning the election and what these new text messages show is, shall we say, dramatic. And, <laughs> and, and she really has the receipts. Also, I think one of the rarest things to find is a intelligent, a nuanced, balanced piece about the whole issue of transgender politics, transgender identity and teaching in schools. And, and Kathy Young has a has a deep dive in today's bulwark, which uh, manages to pull that off brilliantly. And I strongly recommend both of those pieces. I think they're very important. But I want to talk about what's been happening with the politics of masking. And I want to talk about the politics of genocide and what's going on in Ukraine. But let's do that right after this. So have you ever browsed in incognito mode? It's probably not as incognito as you think. And why would it be? Chances are the browser you're using has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. And what do these big tech companies say when they're called out for collecting your user data? Well, incognito does not mean invisible. So how do you actually make yourself as invisible as possible? You use ExpressVPN like I do. Look, privacy has never been more important than right now. Your privacy, your ability not to have your activities traced is probably more valuable now than it has ever been. So it turns out that even in the incognito mode, your online activity still gets tracked and the data brokers still get to buy and sell your data. One of these data points is your IP address. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location. They know all of that. But with ExpressVPN, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. Do you understand how valuable that is? Every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers, and that makes it much harder for third parties to identify you or harvest your data. Best of all, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. No matter what device you are on, your phone, laptop, or smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button for instant protection. So if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with a number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash bulwark and get three extra months for free. 
That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Bulwark. Go to expressvpn.com slash Bulwark to learn more. Okay, so we are back with Will Salatan. So are, are we, have we exhausted all the Tucker Carlson jokes? Have you know, we, there we just, just to, okay. I just wanted to make sure that we, inst- we, we get these phrases rolling for the Tucker jokes that are coming. One is junk science, right? Obviously. Oh, with go, the, that's the, good. The, that's good. The other one, of course, if you've seen these, the, uh, the imagery of the sort of Christ-like uh, homoerotic images, sacrilegious, we, oh. we got to get that going. And of course, nuts. All right. And then we'll, we can move on. Have you made notes here on all of this? <laughs> I... I, I'm I'm looking for an opportunity to work. You know, we we did the serious conversation about it, and I, that was great. But but we got to get the puns in. I think so. Okay, so one of the things we have not talked about for a very long time is the the status of the pandemic and uh, the politics of masking, which I think is having a bigger impact um, on the midterm political climate than I think people have acknowledged it, but. Things get lost. Things get lost in the churn of the news. And I certainly understand that with what's going on in Ukraine. But I want to play a soundbite from uh, Kevin McCarthy and get your reaction on the other side of this. We're not playing political games about some phone call that somebody thought are made up Russia collusion. What we're looking at is real policies about that's harming America. Today, you have an administration that tells every American flying they have to continue to wear a mask. But now he looks at the border and raises Title 42. And to your viewers, what that means is if a border agent finds somebody coming across the border illegally, they send them back to their country. Mm -hmm. He wants to lift that in a time that we have COVID as well. That's irresponsible in his policies moving forward. But we will always go to the rule of law. And wherever it rises, we will hold him accountable to that. Well, there's just so much bullshit uh, compressed into all of that. But uh, your your thoughts, Will, uh, because clearly what you heard Kevin McCarthy articulate is the GOP talking point for 2022. Yeah. I I mean, look, this is a favorite Republican tactic. You are you have one rule. The Democrats have one rule for us real Americans, and then they have another rule for illegal aliens. And they're always giving them benefits. Sometimes it's like medical care that they get and you don't. Um, In this case, it's that you have to wear a mask. You have to follow covid rules. And the the elite quote illegals don't. Right. They're they're going to be allowed into the country, uh, even though under the covid rule, they were supposed to be kept out. So. They're just the Republicans are going to play on that contradiction. Well, you can see how that plays, right? So I have to wear a mask, but we're letting in illegal immigrants uh, across the border. I mean, that's the way that plays in the coffee shops or the George Webb restaurants. Right now. okay, I may surprise you. I'm going to go. I'm going to agree with Kevin McCarthy halfway. Right. So the part where I disagree with him is he's got the timing wrong. Right. There is just to be clear with people, the lifting of Title 42, this thing that prevents people from being allowed into this country under asylum claims, I believe. Uh, They're excluded because of COVID, and that is supposed to end on May 23rd. This thing where we extend the requirement to wear masks on airplanes, the travel the travel rule, for th- that, that is being extended until May 3rd. So in other words, there is no point at which you will be required to wear a mask on an mm-hmm. airplane, mm-hmm. right? And the and people coming into this country without documentation will be allowed to to come in as though. Co- so it's not that there's going to be one rule for you and another rule for them. It's that the, the timing is a little bit off. Having said that, you know, the Republicans have a point that we should be following the same set of rules for everybody. Right. So either covid is bad enough that we require things like masking or it's not that bad, in which case, you know, you change the rules for people coming into this country, applying for asylum or whatever it is. So I, I agree with the Republicans on the principles, just not on the application. No, I can't get over the fact that we have, have we hit the million milestone yet? The million dead Americans from the coronavirus? We're right about there. And yet clearly we're just done with it. I mean, it's, this is, this is where you have the cognitive dissonance. And I, I, you know, it's, people are, they're fed up with it. They really don't want the mask. They want to get on with their lives. Um, and yet we have this massive disaster, you know, looming, you know, what next week or whatever, 1 million, uh, death. Now, I mean, I guess I, I will share some of this frustration. I'll be honest with you. So tomorrow I plan to get my second booster shot. And yet in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get on an airplane and I'm going to have to wear a mask. 
And it's like, what, what, what is, you know, there, there's, there appears to be some inconsistency here. And that's, that is frustrating. I understand that. I'm just, I'm in a very similar position. Um, can I just tell people who have not been tuned into this lately, the message, the tone from the Biden administration lately is very chill about COVID. Yes. Yeah. You know, they're, they're Ashish Jha, the new coordinator of the task force is out on TV, was out on the TV this weekend. And the message is we're not freaked out about case counts. First of all, we're way, way, way down from where we were yeah. in January. Right. And everybody's figured out that Omicron is not as bad as previous variants. And their their message is, you know, we've extended this trap, this rule about wearing the mask on the airplane, but only for a couple of weeks. And the, he all but signaled that it's going to end. Now, we have local things like Philadelphia bringing back its mask mandate. That's not controlled by the Biden administration. That's controlled by wherever you live, right? So the whole tone of what's going on in the country right now is we are dialing down the COVID restrictions. And that's where we are until something gets a lot worse. Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about Mike Lee because I think this is an extraordinary moment. As I mentioned in my newsletter today, it turns out, according to uh, Aaron Rupar, there was no coverage of this on most of the Sunday television shows. Mike Lee was not even mentioned a single time on CNN, State of the Union, Fox News Sunday, NBC's Meet the Press, ABC's This Week, or CBS's Face the Nation. Not one mention of these new revelations about a senator scheming with the Trump administration to end democracy on any of the major Sunday shows, which again is an indication, number one, of how crowded the news cycle is, but also number two, that maybe we're just kind of numbed by all of this. And that's why you know, Amanda Carpenter's breakdown is so, is so valuable. I mean, these text messages show how eager Mike Lee was to come up with some scheme to overturn the election. I mean, you know, that he was one of the people to recommend Sidney Powell. And then belatedly, he realized she was crazy. And then he recommended John Eastman. And then was surprised that that maybe was a little bit crazy. But right up until the end, he's telling Mark Meadows, you know, I'm working 14 hours a day to come up with some bullshit scheme to overturn the election. You know, if we can get some some state legislatures, maybe they can't actually vote, but if they would like sign an email or something saying that they might, we could use that to overturn the election on January 6th. This is Mike Lee, who until five minutes ago actually was considered to be, well, this is one of the constitutional conservatives. This is one of the principled conservatives. What do you make of all of this? Okay. So there's a couple of levels that we can talk about this. One is your, your first point, which really strikes home to me, the extent to which, that what, you know, what Aaron tweeted about that we, that it wasn't covered this weekend, right? It's, we are getting, we get used to things. We just right. get inured to, so it's the mass murder in Ukraine every day. Ho-hum. Now let's move on. You know, the math, we have shootings in the United States. There's been a couple more. Let's, you know, that's just another mass shooting. Let's move on. Here we have, oh, it's just another revelation about the attempt to, to prevent the peaceful transfer of, of power in the United States. It's crazy that we're getting used to it. But we are, right? Isn't that what's happening to the media? It's like, yeah. if this had happened, you know, a year ago, maybe it would have had more news. But let's let's talk about the specifics of these of these texts. This reminds me very much of my old boss, Mike Kinsley, who I worked for at the New Republic. Then it's late. Had a, he had this thing called, you know, Kinsley's Law, which was the scandal is what's legal, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's mm -hmm. like people, and what Mike Lee did here was legal. He was look, explicitly looking for legal means of preventing the peaceful transfer of power. And so you do it by, you know, challenging the election results in court, going, you know, technically the legislature send the electors, so let's go to the legislatures. And so the scandal here is that without technically breaking the law, these people were trying to undermine democracy, right? They were trying to engineer right. a coup, a legal coup. And that to me is what's so scary about these texts. Well, you're right. And Michael Lee's made it very clear that he's not a big fan of democracy in the first place. So this was not that big a leap for him. You know, one of the tells here is that really what a bad lawyer Mike Lee was, uh, the, the writers at the blog Above the Law, 
I had a really interesting post. Donald Trump really needed to stop listening to Mike Lee's terrible legal advice. Uh, the timeline of Mike Lee's communication with the Trump White House runs a little bit like this. Number one, Lee offers a facially terrible idea. Number two, the White House agrees with him. Number three, the idea blows up in their face. Number four, cycle repeats ad infinitum. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, here's a good idea. Huh? We'll try that. Uh, no, that turns out to be a terrible idea. So M Mike Lee scrambling, throwing stuff up against the, the wall. I think Tim Miller made a great point that once again, we're reminded that we are tempted or maybe the spin is that it was just the crazy clown posse that was buying into these nutty ideas. And in fact, it turns out to be relatively reasonably normal Republicans as well. Although, you know, apparently there was a reason why Mike Lee at one time was joined at the hip with Ted Cruz, why he was uh, actually remember back in the day, you're old enough to remember when yeah. Mike Lee was basically Ted Cruz's only friend in the Senate. <laughs> that, that turns out not to apparently be a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's heartwarming that not all of Ted Cruz's friends were imaginary. So OK, that's... so can can we talk about an issue in which I'm right and you're wrong? Go, go for no, it. No, no. I mean, well, I have been right and you have been wrong. Can we talk about that? Let's go because for it, Because there's sure. been way too much agreement so far. So let's do that right after this. The weather is getting warmer and it's lighter later. You know what that means. It's time to take those cigars and drinks outside. Time to soak up the feeling and the flavor of cigar season. And when you're getting ready for cigar season, get the best premium cigars at the lowest prices at Famous Smoke Shop. And it's stress-free cigar shopping at Famous Smoke because every cigar is guaranteed fresh. Famous Smoke knows how to deliver the authentic cigar shop experience because it's been their family business for 83 years. They have decades of cigar knowledge and a huge selection of premium cigars. Famous Smoke Shop was even named the best place to buy cigars online by Cool Material and Cigar World. Famous Smoke Shop offers a huge selection of more than a thousand brands to choose from. You'll find incredible deals on everyday cigars and highly rated classics included Romeo, E. Giulietta, Monte Cristo, Macanudo, Oliva, and Fuente. So if you want your favorite cigars delivered fast and guaranteed fresh, it has to be Famous Smoke Shop. And, you know, when I got my cigars from Famous Smoke Shop, what I love was, first of all, how easy it was, but also the variety of cigars. Because, you know, you're not always in the mood for the same kind of cigar. And particularly this time of year, you might want to mix it up a bit, which I do pretty much every week. So here's your opportunity to save $10 off of your purchase of $50 or more when you go to famous-smoke.com. That's famous-smoke.com and use code BULWARK10 at checkout to save $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. You'll get all of your favorite cigars delivered direct from their humidor to yours. That's promo code BULWARK10 for $10 off your purchase at famous-smoke.com. Great cigar deals only at famous-smoke.com. And remember to use promo code BULWARK and the number 10. Okay, we are back with Will. All right, over the weekend, uh, it turns out that the West has decided that they have not been giving enough material to uh, to the Ukrainians. Very dramatic increase in the kinds of offensive weaponry that we're giving them. We're now giving them you know, 18 howitzers, 11 helicopters, 200 armored personnel carriers, 300 switchblade drones, another 500 javelin missiles, 10 counter artillery radars, a recognition that we have not been giving them enough stuff until now. So perhaps there is this recognition that the war is uh, is winnable. Uh, clearly, there's kind of a morale shift after the sinking of the Moskva. Uh, so your your reaction to that, I mean, I, the reason I said, you know, we've had a disagreement is I've been saying all along we need to do more. And there's been a certain, you know, Biden administration on men corner that's been saying, no, 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 we've been giving them a lot of stuff. Really? Well, e even they seem to be acknowledging that they needed to give them more and they're now giving them more. Well, OK, so this is very much okay. to me like, yeah, this is to me. Uh, come on, like some, some... <laughs> come, come on, come on. Yeah, let's you and me fight about this. Come on. 
All right, you know, Charlie, we should give them less. In fact, we should be on Putin's side. Okay. Well, yeah. All right. So no, seriously, I mostly agree with you. I'm going to disagree perhaps about the limits of what we should do. But like, this goes back to what we were just saying about how we get used to things, right? Putin has been attacking Ukraine. He's been bombing cities, he's been killing civilians, right? And it's going on every day. And we we can't get into the the mindset that like, that's the way it is. And so we just right. do what we've been doing. What Putin is escalating, right? Every day that he kills more civilians, bombs more cities, tries to take more territory, that is a day of Russian escalation, yes. right? We need to match that, okay? So we do need to, and we are matching it. And the part where I will disagree with you is I will take the pro-Biden side. The administration, the United, the United States is sending more weapons, not just more weapons, but different kinds of weapons, right? So we're now sending the, the howitzers and the armored personnel carriers and the helicopters. We're sending them the kinds of things they will need to fight a more offensive war in the east of Ukraine. This is different from what we had before. So they are, we are adapting. We are helping the Ukrainians escalate and they have to escalate because the Russians are doing it to them. So I think that we do need to do more. We are doing more. I regret to inform you, Will, that we are still not doing enough. And this approach that, that many people have been taking um, to believe that the Biden administration knows better than the Zelensky administration, I, I think is wearing a little bit thin. So yes, I think we should applaud this dramatic change in position where the, the, the West has decided that in fact they will give some of the heavy weaponry, but it is not enough. I mean, Ann Applebaum tweeted out over the weekend, you know, with all the numbers that I just listed, she said, this is great, but 18 howitzers will not be enough. They need 100. Same with all the rest of the equipment. And the, in the Wall Street Journal, their, uh, th their reporter, uh, Yaroslav uh, Tromovov, who's really been the expert on, on, on the war, uh, tweeted out uh, some perspective here. 500 javelins will cover three to five days of fighting. 18 howitzers will account for maybe 3% of deployed field artillery. That, uh, that many or more get lost every week. The rate of assistance is a fraction of the rate of depletion. And foreign policy, which reported on this major policy shift to give them more weapons, said, in the eyes of the Ukrainians, this new spate of Western arms transfers is a welcome shift, but still not enough. The current and former Ukrainian officials said the West can still do more to arm the country ahead of what is expected to be a decisive new chapter in the war. And President Zelensky tweeted out, without additional weaponry, this war will become an endless bloodbath, spreading misery, suffering, and destruction. So I, I, again, it, it almost feels like we're doing enough to make it look like we're doing enough, but not what the Ukrainians say that they need. Okay. I, all right. Now, now you've got my juices up here. So first of all, on this question of like, how many howitzers are we sending? Like you're, and, and on all of these, all of the weaponry, you're focusing on what is the absolute number that we have sent so far? And, you know, God bless you for that. Like we do need to be sending more. I'm focusing on the trend line. The trend line is we are now, we have now moved into a new category of weapons, which is exactly what we need to do. And we start with the 18 and we, we move towards more as needed. Right. And and the other thing is, okay, Charlie, could, could I just but, comment on that? Go for it. To say, so here, here, here's our difference. I am commenting on reality. You are commenting on aspirations. This is the difference between neoconservatives and liberals, I think. Here, say, you, know, you are focusing on the actual number, the real world numbers. I am talking about our good intentions. <laughs> yeah. Did I get your juices going again? I mean, that's got to get your juices going. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, okay. I viscerally. Yeah. I love Joe Biden, right? I think Joe Biden is trying to do the right thing. He is moving in the right direction. And I disagree with you on the facts of this, all right? We are we are sending weapons in we are heading towards the number that Zelensky wants. And this thing you repeated a thing which is a Republican talking point. I <laughs> got to get that <sighs> phrase in, right? The Republican talking point is one of them is, you know, the United States isn't serious about winning, isn't trying to win. The other one is that Biden is always second guessing what Zelensky wants. Neither of these things is true. These are radically false, right? The United States absolutely, yes, at the beginning, we didn't think the Ukrainians could hold up. Once the Ukrainians fought, since that moment, we have been trying to help them win. Secondly, on the question of second guessing Zelensky, this is nuts. I mean, what was it? Uh, just a, the, the, the Americans and the Ukrainians 
are talking constantly about the Ukrainians have a shopping list. Here's the weapons we want. The Americans are either providing the weapons to them or looking for third parties in NATO in the West to, who, who have the weapons, you know, the Soviet era weapons that we don't have to send to Ukraine. And then we, we, we backfill them. And that was true about the MiGs, you know, the whole thing about we won't send them the MiGs. You know, the United States absolutely said Poland can send the MiGs. Poland has the MiGs. What we're not going to do is have Poland hand them to us and we transfer them. Poland's next door. Give them the MiGs if you want to give them the MiGs. Don't blame Biden for that. Facts are stubborn things, Will. And this new decision to send the heavy weapon is a dramatic change of our position on all of this. And again, foreign policy, the new arms deliveries represent a stark shift from Western support for Ukraine in, in previous weeks. And again, so I, I know that, that, you know, a month ago, nearly two months ago, we were having a very similar discussion. We're saying, we're not giving enough, we're not giving enough, we're not giving enough. Well, now we are giving a lot more, but it also suggests that this is a dramatic change from when we were not willing to give them this kind of, this kind of weaponry. And the Ukrainians have been eloquent and repeated and consistent and unrelenting in saying we need more stuff. And this is not a republic. This may be a Republican talking point, but it's also a Zelensky talking point. I mean, I'm getting my talking points from the Ukrainians who have been saying this over and over and over again. And now there's a recognition that they're right and we're giving them, but we're giving it to them in this incremental stage. Like we have given them 18 howitzers and people go, wait, 18 howitzers, that's PR as opposed to what might actually be necessary on the ground. And again, look, am I a military expert? No, but the people who are fighting and dying in Ukraine are saying, this is what we need. And, you know, I, I guess the, 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 the approach has been very, very slow. I look, I, at the end of the day, we'll look back on this and say, okay, we actually did step up and give them everything they need. Or we will say, why were we dragging our feet while tens of thousands of Ukrainians were being killed? And, and this, this, you know, this is one of those arguments that I think will be resolved by, by events, by reality. And the reality is right now that there's a real difference of opinion between the Ukrainians and the Biden administration. It's, it's, oh. clo it's closing, but, but there is a difference. And you cannot cover that up by coming up with something like Republican talking points. You just can't okay, look, you know, no, no. Th this yeah. reminds me of nothing so much as look, I'm a, I'm a neoliberal, right? This reminds me of having conversations with people on the left about <laughs> domestic policy. It's never enough. You know, <laughs> the, you're, whatever you pass for the climate, it's not enough. Whatever you pass for medical coverage for people, it's not enough, right? Like, okay, it's not, you know, but we're moving in that direction, right? That's the nature of progress. So here with the neocons, it's how many weapons are you sending? We are trying to send all these weapons. Charlie, you said we're sending them more stuff. It's not just it, more stuff. It's different it, kinds of stuff. And it's different because the nature of the war is changing. That is the fundamental thing. Is, is Vladimir Zelensky a neocon? <laughs> well, I mean, what, you keep throwing these things happen? out. Well, because the neocons say, okay, so... Is no, no, it, because I'm quoting him. I'm not. Right. <laughs> right. He's asking. But Z part of why Zelensky is asking for different kinds of weapons. And it's not Zelensky. It's his military people who are telling him what to ask for. Right. Because they know what's going on on the ground. Ah, Charlie, what is, well, what is going hmm. on on the ground is that the war is changing. We have moved from this sort of, you know, def defending the cities in the in the center of the north of the country. We've moved over to the east and we're going to have this flat terrain. There's going to be like this just back and forth. We're going to we're going to need, you know, tanks, armored personnel carriers. We're going to need helicopters. We're going to be so. We this is very much Charlie like COVID, where the 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 people on the right constantly complain. Hey, you know, you told us to put the masks on, you tell us to take them off, you tell us we need this, then we don't need it. That's because we are learning things, and the situation is changing. A new variant comes in, we have to change. That's not science changing; it's science learning and adapting. Same thing in Ukraine. The nature of the war changes. We need different kinds of weapons. Now we're sending those weapons, not because we just woke up and became good people, but because that's what the Ukrainians are asking for in different proportions because of the nature, the changing nature of the war. Can I just say that, that is a terrible analogy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, we have this pandemic, which we do not understand because it is a variant and it is, it is constantly evolving. 
On the other hand, we have Vladimir Putin and the Russian army. And we knew who they were and what they wanted to do. And we understood what the stakes were. I mean, the Russian army is not the Omicron variant. The Russian army is the fucking Russian army. And they have showed us what they are, what their goals are, and how they behave over and over and over again. So I'm not sure that that actually works. I, under, I take your point about the changing circumstances require changing responses. I'm just not sure that the circumstances have changed that much. I, I think it's been very clear what was going to have to happen. But I do, I do, I do take your point about the fact that we're at a different stage of the war, which requires different response. And I'm glad. Look, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm glad that they're coming around on all of this. I'm glad that they're becoming more aggressive. So can we talk about another possible escalation and see whether Go or not this it. is a good idea? So um, this is Fareed Zakaria on CNN has a proposal for uh, what NATO warship should do. Despite the success of the Neptune missile, Ukraine does not have the capacity to stop the Russian Navy. NATO should consider doing something similar to what it did during the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. It should enforce an embargo around those waters, preventing Russian troops from entering to attack Ukraine cities or resupplying Russian forces. NATO ships would operate from international waters, issuing any approaching ships notice to mariners that NATO forces are active in the area and warnings not to enter. I'm a little confused about it. Well, your, your, your thoughts on that first, Will. Good idea. Yeah, uh, I, I'm a little alarmed by it because while I'm sympathetic to the idea of doing more, this would put NATO in direct confrontation with the Russians. And so, you know, if you want to talk about starting World War III, this is a good way to start it. So I'm not sure about it. On the other hand, we may be forced into it if, you know, if it's the only way to stop the Russians from resupplying. Well, I'm a little bit confused because my understanding was that the Russians could not send more warships into the Black Sea under the current rules. There's a certain protocol that they're not allowed to go in. So that when, this was one of the disasters of losing the Moskva, which was you can't replace it because there are no more ships that are gonna be allowed. I mean, that's basically the deal with Turkey. I'm now out over my skis a little bit on all of this, but I don't think he was suggesting sending uh, NATO ships into the Black Sea because that would be you no know, clear confrontation. You know, the map is complicated if you look at the Sea of Azov is off of Mariupol. Yeah. The Black Sea proper is off of Odessa. So exactly which waters is unclear. But the general idea of NATO setting up a blockade, that is not, it's a little bit like a no-fly zone in the water, right? And, and that is you, you got to be prepared for the same kind of thing, which is a direct confrontation between us and the Russians. So we have a piece by Shea Kateri in uh, The Bulwark today on the question of whether or not what Russia is doing is genocide. And this has become one of those, those weird controversies. Joe Biden declared that, uh, in fact, it was genocide. You have some of the Europeans going, well, we don't want to use too, you know, too strong language. Uh, Rich Lowry, the uh, the editor of National Review, took to the pages of Political Magazine to criticize Joe Biden for using the term genocide. Um, where do you come down on all of this? I, I mean, I have I have some thoughts on it, but it's interesting that we're right now debating whether or not we should use the word genocide or not. Okay, so initially, my gut is on Lowry's side. I'm, I'm hesitant to use the term genocide for anything short of what the Nazis did. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the, the Russians have not been literally rounding up people, putting them in camps and gassing them. Yeah. But there are some other criteria, and Shea points them out, yep. which by which this is genocidal. And I think the one that Biden identified is kind of conceptually key to this, right? Biden said that Putin is trying to destroy the idea of being Ukrainian. Right. And that is absolutely true, right? That is, Putin in his speeches has said the sort of, you know, Ukraine isn't a real thing. The Russians are trying to re-educate the Ukrainians in the places where they control territory, you know, change their understanding of history, of their national identity. Uh, they're trying to depopulate cities. Right. They're trying to get drive people out. They're taking they're taking uh, people from Mariupol, including children, and they're you know they're not letting them go to the west. They're you know, sending them through these filtration camps in the east. What happens to those kids? What happens to those people? If you are eliminating a people where you control territory, and if you are spreading the idea that this is not a real people, you are certainly in the territory of I don't know if it's ethnic cleansing, but national cleansing, and you're on your way to the concept of genocide for sure. 
No, I agree with you on this. I'm, I'm going to side with Joe Biden, that Joe Biden is not going to get caught up in the nomenclature. He is going to call this what it is. And if people want to quibble about the language, uh, they can do that. Um, I, I think one of the things that Shay did that was so valuable is 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 to go through what the United Nations definition of genocide is. You know, I mean, Lowry refers to the definition, he quotes, you know, acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group. But he points out that Lowry stops short of citing what constitutes such acts. Um, this is the, the definition. Number one, killing members of the group. Two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Four, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And what Shea points out is the first two points undeniably happening. The Russian forces are killing Ukrainians, causing them serious bodily or mental harm. Third point is happening as well, which is deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction. And of course, they're, they're not actually, I don't know about preventing births, but um, there's a lot of evidence that they are forcibly, forcibly transferring children and there is no question that Russia is acting with the intent to destroy Ukrainians as a national group because we know that because Russia has been quite clear about its goal. I guess the other point I have, though, is, well, of all of the targets to pick, and I'm not trying to pick on Rick Lowry too much, but of all of the things that you want to, you know, go after with the events that are taking place, to pick the criticism of Joe Biden's use of the word as the as the hill you want to die on it's just like there's all this going on and yet we in the west while people are dying and cities are being destroyed this this massive you know series of war crimes and humanitarian disasters to decide i'm going to pick at you for the word you used and of course this comes from somebody who has argued that you know, at least when Donald Trump was president, that the words don't matter. Don't pay any attention to what he says. We should only be concerned with what he does. And now suddenly they're very, very concerned about the specific vocabulary from the president. It just seems, I don't know, it seems so trivial. It, I mean, it just seems so unserious that we debate the words when children are being bombed. Well, you know, in Lowry's defense, I, I do think that we have – one of the things that happens today is there's a lot of people talking, and we have the internet so everybody can hear everybody else. And one of the results is we get a lot of cheapening of the currency of yeah. words. I mean, the word Nazi, right, which meant Nazi, and now it's like, right. you you know, Rush Limbaugh with feminazi. Now we have Putin uh. calling Ukrainians not – everybody's a Nazi, right? Yeah. So the term loses its meaning. I, do, I don't want to let genocide become another one of those terms that is just like, well, you're attacking and killing people, and that's – therefore genocide. It's not therefore genocide. However, however, Charlie, and this, this is a thought that has been haunting me the entire time of the Ukraine fight. It, I, I think back a lot to when the actual, gen, the, the Holocaust and what Americans were thinking at that time and why we didn't intervene earlier. And you know, the mistake we, we, we made, we didn't know enough about what was going on. We didn't take seriously the, the information that we had about it. Today, I worry about us not doing enough because what Putin is doing in Ukraine isn't exactly like what Hitler did, right? No, it's and not. And therefore somehow, so it, I, I worry about us thinking because it's not the same, because it is not that kind of genocide, we shouldn't treat it with the same seriousness. And it may be that our you know, children and grandchildren looking back at the way we handled this situation, that one of the storylines is that because it wasn't Hitler, the, the West didn't take it as seriously as we should have. Yeah, that's an excellent point. No, I think sometimes our, our imagination becomes impoverished and we only have one standard that to react to. So if it's not that, then, well, we're not going to react to it as dramatically as we would have. But this is our generation's test. And I think, you know, part of what we're dealing with here, to go back to your point about, you know, changing circumstances is the the world order is changing um, in fundamental ways in a very short period of time. And it's going to take us a while, I think, to adapt to it, to adapt to what is it that we're actually confronting? What it, What is the reality? Because we've been telling ourselves a lot of stories for the last uh, several decades that that now uh, look like fairy tales. But it's going to take a while for us to figure out exactly how do we adapt to this new world in which Russia is uh, not going to be in any way a partner or we're not going to be able to coexist uh, in the way that we thought we were going to be able to coexist with them. They're going to be a pariah nation, I hope, 
I hope that Vladimir Putin remains a pariah for the rest of his life. Uh, but that 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 changes the formula of international relations in a fundamental way. And I'm not sure that and any of us are really fully prepared to understand the way the world is going to look in a few years compared to what it looked like a few years ago. Yeah, you know, and and I think a lot about what you know Barack Obama and Mitt Romney in the in 2012. It's in yeah. that debate. When Obama says to Romney when Romney says Russia is the number one threat. Obama says the 1980s want their, their they call right. they want their foreign policy back. Well, now the 2000 <laughs> the 2010s the to the 2012s want their foreign policy back. Right, that Obama's view is the one that is outdated today. Yeah, and apparently now we have the 1930s issues back again. So what are you working on, Will? What can we look forward to this week? I'm always well, looking forward um, to your stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a longer term project about uh, the sort of the history of the Trump era and particularly Lindsey Graham's role in it. And uh, so that's that's a thing that I hope to get get done in the next few weeks. And Lindsey um, Graham. Yeah, because I think the big story of our time, Charlie, is um, what, not the only big story, but a, a big story of our time is that is the, the Mike Lees and the Lindsey Grahams and the Ted Cruz's and all these people who presented themselves as normal Republicans who, mm -hmm. in a time of authoritarianism, yeah. just bent the knee. And that is not a, that is not something specific to Russia or Ukraine. It can happen anywhere. And it happened in the United States. Oh, I, I, I could not agree with you more strongly there. I mean, I, I, I have been arguing really, you know, since 2016, that the, that the really big story is, is, is not just Donald Trump himself, but, but turn the, turn the focus to the people that are willing to go along with him. And, and, you know, you know, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He does what he does. It's the acquiescence of the people who, you know, should have been the, the guardrails, you know, should have been the check on him and the quote unquote normal Republicans. And it runs, you know, I mean, Ted Cruz is Ted Cruz, but, and, you know, but, you know, I mean, it, it just, it, the rot runs so deep, you know, the Marco Rubio's and, well, I mean, you, you can pretty much go throughout the entire Republican United States Senate, you know, un until you get to Mitt Romney and maybe on a good day, Ben Sass, maybe on a good day if it's a Wednesday. Right. You know. And people call this Trump derangement syndrome and that they miss the point. The point is Trump was just the guy who came along who exposed it. That's it. The, 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 the real menace is the, the so-called normals and the, at what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. That's the, it's so easy for this to happen, even in a country we think is somehow special and above it. I am very anxious to see that piece. Uh, Will, uh, thanks for coming back. We'll talk to you again next Monday. Thanks, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again. juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth, the Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on, on your podcast, That's the Brown Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, outed you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.